Today, I would like to share with you our new molecular biology toolbox that we call GEARS. GEARS stands for Genetically Encoded Affinity Reagents, and we use this toolbox to study endogenous protein localization and also manipulate proteins. And this toolbox was initially designed for the use in zebrafish, but it's equally um, applicable to many other, other model species. And so, in the Heraldus lab, we study the zygotic genome activation. This is a fundamental developmental process during early embryonic development, where the newly formed embryo will initiate transcription from its own genome for the very first time. And in zebrafish embryos, I'm not doing anything. Can we go back? I'm going to try this. So sorry. I think there might be a slight delay. Um, so in zebrafish embryo, this process is initiated at two hours post-fertilization. And by three hours post-fertilization, most of the uh, zygotic genomes, most of the genes are actively being transcribed. Um, so on the top, you can see that this process is regulated by a highly specialized group of transcription factors that are called pioneer factors. And pioneer factors have the unique ability to bind nucleosomal DNA, and it will open it up and make the chromatin accessible for other transcription factors and for transcription machinery. And so pioneer factors are very well characterized in zebrafish. There's three of them, um, and in a second, I will show you what they look like. Thank you. Sorry. Um, if you just click one further. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so there's three transcription factors. They're called NANOC, OCT4, and SOX19B. And um, we know they're highly important for embryonic development because when we knock them out, the embryo will arrest in its development a few hours after fertilization. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Oh, there we go. Okay, something's happening. Um, so on the right-hand side, you see the knockout embryo at a, will arrest at early development. And so the biology of pioneer factors is very well characterized. However, there is uh, significantly less known about the, how endogenous pioneer transcription factor proteins behave. And this is because generally or traditionally, endogenous proteins have been studied using antibodies or by creating direct fusion proteins using genome engineering. And the zebrafish community lacks a lot of primary antibodies. And for example, we don't have antibodies to detect our favorite pioneer transcription factors. By inserting, okay, by inserting, um, for example, GFP into your gene of interest, you can circumvent the need for uh, a protein-specific antibody because anti-GFP antibodies are readily available. Um, however, inserting large fragments into the genome, such as GFP, is still often very difficult in zebrafish, and large inserts also can, are more probable of interfering with the protein function. If you do generate a big knock-in uh, of, for example, a red fluorescent protein, you have created a monofunctional allele, meaning if you want to swap your red fluorophore for your green fluorophore, you have to create a whole new CRISPR line. And so we wanted to find a better way of being able to study our favorite proteins, our pioneer factors, but avoiding all of these problems that I've just outlined to you. And so we settled on genetically encoded tags. And these are short epitope tags, and a list of them you can see here. Um, and you might recognize some of these names. But what they have in common is that they're very small. They're all smaller than 19 amino acids and therefore significantly smaller and shorter than a normal GFP protein. And these tags come as a two-component system. They're recognized by their cognate binders, which are single-chain variable fragments or nanobodies. And these tag and binder pairs have been reported in the literature within the last 10 years. And so the idea is that we can very easily knock these short epitope tags into our locus of interest. Because of their size, we'll get a high integration efficiency. And because they're so small, they're less likely to interfere with the protein function. The binder can then be um, either injected as an RNA or protein or expressed um, as a transgene depending on the model organism that you work with. So as an example, 
if we use the alpha tag and we knock it into our gene of interest, we can then use the alpha nanobody to recognize the alpha um, on the expressed protein. And then we can add a tag to that nanobody uh, to, for investigation. And that is basically what our toolbox contains. It's an array of tag and binder pairs that be, can be combined with different adapters to suit many different uh, molecular biology approaches. And so if we stay with our example of the alpha tag, if we can now fuse GFP to the alpha nanobody and you can investigate your favorite protein's localization using microscopy, then very easily we can swap the GFP for a Degron and investigate what happens if we degrade your favorite protein. And then we can swap the de Degron out for Tobo ID and identify the proximal interaction partners of this protein. So using this toolbox, we only have to generate one knock-in line using a small epitope tag into our favorite gene of interest to then be able to study molecular processes using um, all of the different um, adapters that are available. And so today, I would like to show you that GEARS function in vivo, and then I would like to introduce to you a protein-specific degradation system before showing you that we can use this toolbox to actually answer biological questions. So first, do gears actually function in vivo? And to test this, we, we went back to our zebrafish embryo. We injected one cell stage embryos with RNA that express either a nanobody or a single chain variable fragment fused to GFP. And then we co-injected these embryos with a construct expressing the nuclear transcription factor NANOG with, containing our epitope tag. So if this system works, the, the fluorescent protein should be relocalized to the nucleus to bind to its target. So in the absence of, of a target, we see diffuse cytoplasmic and nuclear fluorescence, but when we introduce our nuclear target, we see robust localization of the fluorescence to the nucleus. And we can show this in more detail by taking a line through the cell and plotting the fluorescence intensity on the y-axis over the distance on the x-axis. And in the highlighted region, you can see that within the nucleus, we're now accumulating most of the fluorescence. And we can also quantify this as the ratio of the nuclear to cytoplasmic fluorescence. And we see that there's differences in efficiencies in the target uh, localization with the moon and the alpha tag being the most efficient. We can also say that the gear binders can fold in vivo at temperatures and pH different to their initial design and cell culture. And we also find that there are some off-target effects using the single-chain variable fragments, which is why going forward we have focused on the nanobody-based binders. So in summary, GEARS can detect exogenously expressed protein in vivo. So next we wanted our toolbox to contain the option for a targeted protein degradation system. And so here we turn to an existing nanobody-based degron system that is called um, ZGRAD. And ZGRAD uses a zebrafish FBOX protein fused to an anti-GFP nanobody. And this nanobody recognizes GFP-labeled uh, proteins, marks them for degradation via, the, uh, via ubiquitin. And so we have adopted this system for our use by fusing the FBOX protein to our nanobodies that we're using. And so we're now testing these new, newly generated degrons. And we do this using a reporter system where we're expressing one-to-one -one stoichiometric amounts of a red fluorescent membrane protein and a green fluorescent nuclear protein. So in the nucleus, we have an H2B protein that is fused to GFP and an epitope tag. And then once we add the Degron to this, the Degron will recognize the epitope tag and specifically degrade our nuclear protein while the membrane protein is unaffected. And so in zebrafish embryos, we tested the system by injecting one cell embryos with the reporter plus or minus the Degron, and then we imaged embryos 10 hours later. And this is a control embryo where we see robust expression of the nuclear GFP protein and the membrane red protein. And when we now add our Degrons to this, you can see that there's a robust clearance of the nuclear fluorescent protein, which is even more obvious when we look at the GFP channel in isolation. And we find that there's a, um, a graded efficiency in our different degrons, but overall they significantly reduce the um, nuclear fluorescence. And again, we can quantify this as the ratio of the nuclear to membrane fluorescence 
And in gray, you see the control, and in pink, you see the different Degron efficiencies. And we find that the alpha grad shows the highest efficiency and clears about 90% of the nuclear protein. But next, we wanted to know how quickly does alpha grad actually function? What are the kinetics of this Degron? And to answer this question, we did a very similar experiment, first in fish and then in mouse embryos. So in fish embryos, we used a reporter. This is a GFP, a cytoplasmic GFP fused to the alpha tag and an injection control. And then 20 minutes later, at the two cell stage, we inject the Degron into one of the two cells, leaving the other cell as an internal control. And then we image those embryos. And I will play this video for you in a moment, and I just want to outline that on the left-hand side of the embryo that was injected with the Degron, while the right-hand side did not contain the Degron. And so when we look over time, we see the, the accumulation of GFP on the right-hand side of the embryo, suggesting to us that um, injecting alpha-grad at the two-cell stage prevents any eGFP accumulation in the cells that contain it, suggesting that the kinetics are fast enough to degrade all newly synthesized protein. But how good is this Degron at degrading an existing pool of protein? So we did a very similar experiment, but this time in mouse embryos, where we injected the one-cell embryo with the reporter, and at the two-cell stage, taking away the punchline here, at the two-cell stage, we then injected the Degron into one of the two cells, whereas the second cell stays as the internal control. But mouse embryos develop significantly slower than fish embryos. And so between the two injections, we have 24 hours, which is a sufficient amount of time to accumulate a lot of GFP fluorescent protein in the nucleus. And then we did a time course, and you can see it up here, where we have two, three, six, nine, and 12 hours after injection of the Degron. And even after two hours, we already see a significant reduction in the GFP um, concentration, and then by three hours, it is basically gone. And so when we quantify this, we also find that um, alpha-grad clears 50% of the nuclear protein within two hours of mRNA injection. And so to summarize this part, we find that gears bind and degrade protein with high efficiency, and it can target proteins across species. So I showed you mouse and zebrafish. And alpha-grad it shows the highest efficiency and clears 50% of nuclear protein within two hours of um, injection. So to finish my talk, I wanted to show you that we can actually use these tools that we've built to address biological questions. And so we use genome engineering to insert the alpha tag into the lab's favorite gene, NANOC. This is the nuclear transcription factor that is responsible or partly responsible to activate genes in the early embryo. And so we made homozygous fish lines that now express the alpha tag on all nanog, and we can now use commercially available alpha reagents, such as an alpha antibody, to do a Western blot. So we were never able to do a Western blot before. I think it died again. Um, so imagine a beautiful Western blot that shows you, I swear it's not noisy at all. Oh, there we go. Um, and so we can look at the um, endogenous levels of our protein of interest, which the lab has never been able to do within 10 years of its existence or more. Um, and we can now take this knowledge and actually compare it to what uh, ze the zebrafish community normally does, which is mRNA injections to study proteins in the early embryo. Um, and so we can see, actually, we can now quantify how much protein is actually produced um, for uh, doing our mRNA injections, and we can see that compared to um, the endogenous levels, we actually produce an overexpression scenario where we express the mRNA injection leads to two to four times the amount of endogenous protein present. And this is really interesting to us because our lab and others have recently shown that the nanoc protein um, accumulates in these high fluorescent foci doing the zygotic genome activation with important functions. And this is due to the intrinsically disordered regions within the protein that um, engage in concentration-dependent accumulations. Um, and so it's a very sticky protein. And we were wondering, now that we can actually look at the endogenous protein, does it behave in the same way as previously reported? So we used the system to investigate the endogenous behavior. We used our homozygous knock-in fish lines. And at the one-cell embryo, we injected the alpha nanobody with GFP uh, tagged to it to do live imaging. And as a control, 
we also um, mimic the overexpression scenario where we inject RNA into the wild type embryo. And so as expected, for, as, and as previously published, um, the overexpression of nanog in wild type cells leads to the accumulation or the formation of these foci. And these are stills from live imaging experiments. And you can see over time, we accumulate these bright foci. But unexpectedly, when we look at the endogenous um, situation, we see a loss of many of these fluorescent foci. We see way fewer, and we actually, which is consistent with a lower overall protein concentration. But we do re robustly and reproducibly observe these two large fluorescent foci, which we know from previous experiments correspond to the MIR430 locus within the um, zebrafish genome, which is a huge um, locus that is tethered or like um, tiled with nano binding sites. And so we can see that in the endogenous concentration, but in the exogenous um, overexpression scenario, we cannot dis distinguish all of these bright foci. And so this can have two different explanations. One being that all nanoc endogenously or exogenously provided will seed in the same places, but the levels of the endogenous protein are so low that they're below our sensitivity of our imaging experiments. And that when you just have more protein present, it will seed in the correct places, and because it is so sticky, it will recruit other proteins and form these really bright, big foci. The other option is that in addition to the endogenous binding sites, the overexpression leads to ectopic binding of nano to maybe uh, low efficiency or uh, low affinity binding sites. And just by the pure amount of nano present in the embryo now, we, we get um, binding to different sites. And we're still trying to disentangle this question using chip seek and other um, techniques. But hopefully, um, so hopefully in the future we can disentangle this. And just to summarize, GEARS can visualize endogenous protein behavior, um, which can lead or reveal novel principles of protein function. And so I hope I've convinced you today that this toolbox actually provides a versatile system for probing and perturbing endogenous protein function. And if you would like to try it out in your model system of choice, please come and see me We're, or write me an email. We are more than happy to share all of these reagents. And so I would like to thank um, my supervisor, Antonio, and um, all our collaborators, and specifically uh, Curtis. This is an equal, um, uh, an equal collaboration. I'm very thankful for all of his work. And I would like to thank HFSP for funding this postdoctoral work and giving me the opportunity to present it to you. Thank you. Because of time limitation, actually, we're going to have only one question. Yeah, okay. um, yeah, yeah very powerful approach. Um, I'm just curious about um, if you want to extend this beyond you know, nuclear and membrane protein mm -hmm. target, because it's especially a localization method, what are the challenges in extend it to other subcellular organs, but also going beyond you know, different tag locations, beyond mm -hmm. the epitope tag? Yeah, yeah so we've um, so far tested it for, you know, big compartments, nucleus, cytoplasm, membrane, and all of these work really well. And I guess that the challenge, a challenge is if you want to detect something in a smaller compartment, you just have to make sure that your nanobody goes there too, right? And so we haven't been able to, or we haven't been able to do that yet, we haven't tried, but I'm sure that it's a little bit more challenging to do that for sure. <laughs> 